Hi everyone, I'm Rachel from the Center for Women's Justice, CWJ, and I'm so excited that you're all here with me today for our Ruth Reactions and Taking Action event with CWJ and the amazingly talented Miriam Anzavin. So the Center for Women's Justice is a legal advocacy organization in Israel that defends women's rights whenever they're violated by the state in the name of religion. We're creating social change in Israel through strategic litigation in the courts, by reshaping the public discourse, and through practical civil and halakhic tools that ensure marital freedom for women. And speaking of marital freedom for women, today's event is all about that or rather, lack thereof. We're going to talk about the Book of Ruth and the practice known as Yibum in Jewish law. We'll explain what that is soon, though those of you who've been following Miriam's Duff reactions have got a little head start there. So Miriam's gonna give you all an exclusive premiere of her Ruth reactions video, which I am super excited about, and then share some thoughts. And then CWJ's Rivka Lubitsch, who is a Toenet Rabbani, aka a rabbinic court advocate, is going to talk all about how these laws affect Jewish women today by sharing some stories of three real cases. Then I'm going to share some of CWJ's practical solutions, and then we'll have a few minutes for the audience questions at the end. So please feel free to drop your questions into the chat. So without further ado, I am honored to give the floor to Miriam. Miriam, we are so grateful for your dedication, talent, and your partnership in making this event happen. So please, everyone give a virtual silent round of applause to Miriam Anzabin. Shalom friends, my name is Miriam Anzabin, and indeed you may know me from the internet. For those who are already familiar with my videos, you'll already know several pertinent things for this event. Firstly, that I am a massive fan for the Center of Women's Justice, massive, massive, massive fan of their work and what they do. And the second thing is that I, along with everyone else currently learning the Daf Yomi Talmud cycle, am in the midst of Tractate Yevamot. Now, when I reread the book of Ruth in order to react to it and thus create the Ruth Reactions video that you'll see today, I was pretty stunned because it finally became clear to me how much of the story revolves around Yibum, which is the type of marriage situation that we are learning about in Yibamot right now. I never realized that before. But then again, I've never done Daf Yomi before, so I sure have received a new perspective. So my authentic reaction to the Book of Ruth was primarily empathy. Empathy for our two heroines, Ruth and Naomi, as they relied upon each other to survive in a society not designed to support women and certainly not to support widows. And all the more so because in this regard, I think we all feel our world has not changed perhaps as much as we would like. But we'll get to that and what we can do to change it in a little bit. For now, please enjoy the whole Ruth Reactions Megillah. Shalom friends, welcome to Ruth Reactions, part one. The holiday of Shavuot is here. It celebrates several things. Firstly, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. We do a lot of Torah study on Shavuot, like all day, all night. And at the same time, Shavuot, is a harvest festival. It's really doing the most. One of the things that we study on Shavuot is the Book of Ruth. This Megillah is a family drama with two central female characters, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. The story centers their loyalty and devotion to each other in a time and a place where their entire socioeconomic status was defined by their relationships to men. Now, a major plot point in the story revolves around Yibum, which is a very specific type of marriage, let's just say. If a married man dies without having children, his brother then is supposed to go and marry his widow, redeeming her. Their child will carry on the name and legacy of her deceased husband. The Book of Ruth presents a quite idealized version of this marital scenario. It's got an almost fairy tale-like quality to it. But like many fairy tales or folk tales, our heroine has to go through a whole lot of tragedy and drama before she's offered her happily ever after. Our story begins once upon a time in the land of Israel. Unfortunately, there is a famine. A man named Elimelech from the city of Beit Lechem took his wife Naomi and their two sons and pieces out to the land of Moab, where apparently there were no supply chain issues and they still had food. Elimelech dies, so Naomi is a widow. 
Her two sons married two local Moabite women. Their names were Orpah and Ruth. But after about 10 years, Naomi's sons also die. Naomi is emotionally devastated. And since the famine seems to have ended, she's like, I am out. I'm going back. I'm done with this place. She starts heading back on the road to Beit Lechem, followed by Orpah and Ruth. Naomi tries so hard to dissuade them from following her. She says, you have been both so lovely and so kind to me, but I don't have any more sons to offer you. Go back home and find security with new husbands because honestly, apparently that's the best we can hope for in this society. Don't sacrifice your options just to follow me. And there's a lot of emotions going on. Everybody's crying. But at the same time, Orpah is like, as sad as I am to say it, points have been made. And she goes home. But our girl Ruth has a very different plan. Stay tuned for part two. Shalom friends, welcome back to Ruth Reactions part two. Naomi continues to attempt to dissuade Ruth from following her. She's like, follow your sister-in-law, go back to your own people, go back to your own gods. Ruth says, stop trying to get me to leave you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I shall be buried. And nothing but death will part me from you. Oh, that gets me every time. So you can't really argue with a speech like that and Naomi knows it. Naomi and Ruth continue on to Beit Lechem. Their arrival is like the breaking news in the city. It is the hot gossip. It is the tea. Like it's that Lady Whistledown reporting from the corner levels. Everybody's like, oh my God, is that Naomi? It's Naomi. Did you see? Naomi is not in a mood for this. She says, nah, don't, don't call me that anymore. Naomi means pleasant. And guess what? My life sucks. You should call me Mara from now on because God made my life bitter. Just chock full of misfortune. Okay, so don't start with me. That is indeed one way to make a memorable entrance. Ruth and Naomi had absolutely nothing. So Ruth decides to go out and glean behind the reapers in the fields to try and get some grain for her and Naomi to eat. Naomi had a relative on Elimelech's side of the family. His name was Boaz and he was conveniently rich. So Ruth is out here gleaning and what a delightfully lucky plot twist. Guess who owns this land? Here he is for a meet cute. It is obviously Boaz. He immediately establishes himself as quality love interest material by treating the people working in his fields like human beings. Low bar, but you know. He looks over and he sees Ruth. He asks his assistant manager who she is. And he's like, oh yeah, that's Naomi's daughter-in-law. She's been here on her feet all day so she and Naomi can eat. Boaz is very impressed by both her work ethic and the way she's supporting Naomi. He tells her, stick around, don't go to any other fields. If you're thirsty, go get some of that complimentary Gatorade over there. And don't worry, the men here will not harass you because I have instituted a no sexual harassment policy in these fields. And she bows down in gratitude and says, why are you being so nice to me? I'm not even from here. And Boaz tells Ruth it's because he knows of her reputation that she chose to go with Naomi to take care of her and completely left her own land and family to do it. And he says to her, I hope that God rewards you because you deserve it. Stay tuned for part three. Shalom friends, welcome back to Ruth Reactions part three. Things have escalated rather quickly for Boaz in the falling hard department. By lunchtime, he's, he's calling her over to eat with him and giving her extra food. During the afternoon gleaning, he makes sure all of his workers know to be super nice to her and also, intentionally, not intentionally, let some extra grain fall so that she can glean it. She works all day and into the evening. And she takes the barley she's harvested back to Naomi, plus her leftovers from lunch. And Naomi is like, where did you glean today? Who is this nice? And Ruth is like, oh uh, yeah, it's this guy, um, Boaz. He has a field over there. And the wheels begin to turn for Naomi. And she's like, oh, you don't say. I guess God didn't really fully abandon us after all. Naomi then explains that Boaz is actually a kinsman of Ruth's dead husband, meaning that technically he could be a redeeming kinsman 
who could marry Ruth, carry on her dead husband's name, and at the same time, provide for them? So as he had invited her to do throughout the rest of the barley and the wheat harvests, she's working alongside the maidservants of Boaz. Naomi has now moved into planning mode. It is time for a Bridgerton level scheme. She tells Ruth, we really need to find a home where you can be happy and cared for. And I think we all know whose home that is. Here's the plan. Boaz will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor tonight. Now that is not actually a euphemism, but maybe it should be. You're gonna go to the threshing floor, see where he lies down, and then you're gonna go over there, uncover his feet, and lie down there. Now Ruth trusts that Naomi knows what she's talking about, and she does just what she says. In the middle of the night though, Boaz wakes up to discover a random woman in bed with him, and he's like, ah, who are you? And Ruth says, it's me, Ruth, your maidservant, Cover me with your robe because you are a redeeming kinsman. Boaz is flattered. He is thrilled. He's like, oh my gosh. He thanks her for not turning to a younger man, which does make me wonder about the age difference. But up until here, it's been green flags all the way. So let's just let this go. But there is a potential hiccup. There is another man with a closer familial relationship to Elimelech. Boaz knows that and says, okay, if he's going to act as a redeemer, I get it. But if he doesn't, I'm gonna. They lie down together for the night. Maybe nothing happened. Maybe something happened. But it's none of our damn business anyway. Give them some privacy. Next morning, Boaz sneaks her out, but he doesn't leave her empty-handed. He gives her more food to take home to Naomi. He's not stupid. So she gets back home and Naomi is like, now when she hears about it and sees the extra food, Naomi knows exactly what is up. He is gonna settle this with alacrity. Just you watch. Stay tuned for part four. Shalom friends, welcome back to Ruth Reactions, part four. Unsurprisingly, Naomi was not wrong. Boaz goes immediately to find that other relative. That relative is not named, so I'm gonna call him Fred. And Boaz gathers Fred and the elders of the city together because guess what, court is now in session. So Boaz is like, Fred, you know that Naomi is back, right? And she needs to sell her ancestral property that she got from Elimelech. So if you want the land, technically you do have first dibs. And Fred's like, yeah, pff, totally, I'll take that, duh. Boaz goes, okay, but just FYI, you realize that with that comes the obligation to marry Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, right? So she can perpetuate the name of her dead husband. And if you have a son with her, that land will revert to him. Now, are you sure? And Fred's like, actually, that seems like a bit much. So I'm not gonna sign up for that. And Boaz is like, oh, well, I guess I'll have to do it. So they go ahead and validate this exchange by handing over a sandal. That is a thing. Boaz makes totally sure that everybody knows that they just witnessed him acquiring all of Elimelech's things, including technically Ruth. And everybody's like, yes, amazing. Love that for you. I know this probably won't be a shock to you, but Boaz and Ruth get married and they have a baby, Mazel Tov. And all the women say to Naomi, wow, looks like you were blessed after all. Your grandson is the son of your daughter-in-law who is worth seven sons. Ruth's son had a son and his son had a son and his son was King David. What a happily ever after, right? There are several important takeaways. In this story, Yibum was the mechanism of Ruth and Naomi's survival. It doesn't always end up like this. Technically, a widow could not go on and marry just anybody in her life until her and her redeeming kinsman had gone through a ceremony called chalitza, which breaks the obligation. If, for example, the brother-in-law does not release that widow through chalitza, she's an aguna. According to the Center for Women's Justice, in Israel, the rabbinate deals with about 15 to 20 cases of chalitza per year. To make a widow go through this, that is a yikes to me. The Book of Ruth has some profound lessons to teach us. It can and it should encourage us to care more collectively about the fate of women, of widows, of converts, of economically disadvantaged people, of immigrants in our communities. Ruth demonstrates how we, all of us, can stand by each other during times of deepest personal distress. That's why she merits to not only be the ancestor of King David, but have a whole Megillah named after her. May we all merit to live up to her incredible example. Chag Shavuot Sameach, everybody.
Oh, yeah. So thanks for all the thoughtful points that you raised in the video. Um, and now we're going to hear from CWJ's Rivka Lubitsch, who has been in the trenches for decades advocating for women in Israel in the rabbinic courts. So she's going to tell you about Yibum and Chalitza and how they affect women today. So Rivka, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Miriam, for your wonderful Ruth reaction. That was amazing. I'm going to start out my talk with an explanation of what Yibum and Halitza are, even though Miriam mentioned it in her reactions already. But I guess I'll do it again a little slower, and then I will explain the problem, trying to make it short and simple. Finally, I will relate to three cases brought before the Beddin. I won't have time for possible solutions, but Rachel Stoma will talk after me about what the Center for Women's Justice does today. The Torah says the following, if brothers reside together and one of them dies childless, the dead man's wife shall not marry an outsider. Her husband's brother must come to her, taking her as his wife in a leveret marriage. The firstborn son whom she bears will then perpetuate the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be obliterated from Israel. So according to the Torah, the widow of a childless man is taken by his brother. Let's please note that unlike the story of Megillat Rut, where a far relative does yibum, according to the Torah and Halakha today, it is only the brother's obligation. It's also important to note that according to the basic law, the brother doesn't need to marry the widow. He just takes her, which means he has sexual relations with her and that, auto and that automatically makes her become his wife. Also note that she is not allowed to marry, as Miriam said, any other man unless she gets chalitza from the brother, which is the ritual that frees the widow, to be explained. What's very important to understand is that if the husband does have children, sexual relations between the widow and any of the deceased brothers are completely prohibited. The offspring of a relationship between the widow and a brother, if the deceased left children, will be mamzerim, and they will not be allowed to marry at all, ever. So again, a married man died. If he has children, she is absolutely not allowed to ever have sex with his brothers. If he has no living child, she is supposed to be taken by the brother, and she cannot marry anyone unless she gets chalitza. You can imagine that this is very problematic. What if she doesn't want to marry him? What if he doesn't want to marry her? What if she wants to marry one of the brothers, but another one wants to marry her? Maybe he's married. Maybe he lives on the other side of the world. Maybe the only brother is in a coma. Well, the Torah isn't really bothered by the question of her not wanting to marry the brother-in-law. Nobody asked her, maybe because who cares what she wants, or maybe it was just obvious in the time of the Torah that she would want to stay within the paternal family and be provided for. The Torah does lay down the rules about what should happen if the brother doesn't want to take the widow. That's when Chalitza comes in. The Torah says the following, but if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, the brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother has refused to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He does not wish to perform the obligation of a husband's brother with me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And he shall stand up and say, I do not wish to take her. Then his brother's wife shall approach him before the eyes of the elders and remove his shoe from his foot. And she shall speak before his face and declare, Thus shall be done to the man who will not build up his brother's household. And that family should be called in Israel the household of the one whose shoe has been removed. This ritual that reads like something ancient actually takes place even today. Yes, there is a special sandal in the Bedin that is put onto the brother's foot and tied up his leg. And yes, she spits on the floor before him or on a special pillow that's brought for her, and she's not allowed to brush teeth that morning so that for sure she's spitting her spit, her saliva and not Colgate or something. And all this is recited word for word. 
This ritual is not a divorce, but it is as if the woman is divorced because after this ritual is performed, she is free to marry anyone except a Kohen. So she is thought of as a divorcee. Just like a divorced woman cannot marry a Kohen, so a woman who had chalitza cannot marry in a Kohen. In the Mishnah, the Talmud, and throughout Jewish history, rabbis have disagreed on the question of whether yibum should take place today, that's the part with the sex, or whether we should prefer chalitza, the part with the sandal, and not allow yibum at all, because people today have the wrong ideas and the wrong thoughts when doing it. They're not doing it just for the name of the deceased. So in the Sephardi communities, yibum is preferred. And in the Ashkenazi communities, chalitza was preferred. The chief rabbinate in Israel in 1950 set a regulation holding that in Israel, only chalitza will take place. Hey, Rabbi Vadi Yosef, who later became chief rabbi, did not agree with that. He was pro yibum and said and did whatever he wanted. Now, a man can refuse to do chalitza, and then the woman is stuck. Like we said before, she is an aguna, even though her children will not be thought of as mamzerim, but she still cannot marry. Maybe the brother wants money from her. I've heard of a story where the brother wanted a half a million shekel to perform the ritual. Maybe he doesn't want to take part in a religious humiliating ritual. It is the widow who has to go begging to the brothers to help her out of her situation. In Israel, where there is no civil religion, a woman cannot marry anyway until she undergoes this ritual, which is quite awful and is done in front of 10 men at least, if not all the rabbis who gather around at the Beddin to watch it. But worse, what if the brother is a katan under age? It can't be done by someone under the age of 13. The widow would have to wait till he grows up, like we hear of in the story of Ruth, to make it clear. If there are no brothers, she doesn't need to do yibum or chalitza at all. She's free to marry whoever she wants. But if there is any brother underage, she is stuck to wait for him to grow up. What if the brother is not fit halachically to do yibum or chalitza? A deaf man cannot do chalitza. He can't hear the words that are said in the ritual. Or if he is mute, he can't recite the text he is required to say. I'm not going into detail as to the question of deaf people, who according to many liberal rabbis are just as hearing people if they speak sign language or can communicate in any way with others. But most of the rabbis in the Beitim would claim deaf people to be unable to do chalitza. Three quick stories, which will give you an idea of how relevant these halachot are for women even today. First story, an older woman, maybe around 70, comes to get married for the third time. First time divorced, second time widowed. And the Rabbanut discovers that she hasn't done chalitza from the second husband. She finds his only brother, and he is diabetic, on a, on a dialysis machine, and with his leg amputated from the knee. The rabbis don't know what to say. Can they do chalitza with the sandal if there's only part of the leg? How do they get the sandal on the leg? Sounds like an anti-Cinderella story. Is she going to be stuck as an aguna because the sandal doesn't fit onto him? He is impotent anyway because of his sickness. According to Halakha, if she is exempted from Yibum, normally she would be exempted from Chalitza. Will the rabbis argue that the widow is exempted from Chalitza if he is impotent being that he is not able to do Yibum anyway? And what about her age? Is she exempted from Chalitza because she is too old anyway to have children? What's the point of having sex with the brother when you're not able to have children? The whole discussion may have caused her to postpone her marriage. But one very clever rabbi came up with a solution and wrote it up in many pages. Basically, he claimed to annul the second marriage, saying that the witness of the wedding was non-religious and therefore not kosher. If she wasn't really married, she doesn't need yibum or chalitza at all. Hmm, makes you think. Second story. 
A woman calls me up to say that her husband died and none of the four children she and her husband raised are actually from her husband's sperm, but all from a donor. This probably happens more and more these days when we have technology to do these things, but the couple kept it as a secret. No one knows this. They didn't want the children to know that the father wasn't their biological father. He wanted to keep the fact that he was sterile to themselves. Now, if she wants to get chalitza from one of the brothers, and according to Halakha, she needs to get chalitza in order to be able to go on with her life, that means letting out the biggest secret of her husband's life, her, the deceased husband. She was also worried that her in-laws would cut relations with her children if it's revealed that they are not blood relatives. She told me that she will never go out again or meet any man if she really has to do chalitza. I turned to a rabbi from the Beddin who after yelling at me for calling him up and not going to the Beddin explained that they will have to see medical records of his and study the case with the religious court. That means three Dayanim will have to call her, she'll have to come into the Beddin and they'll have to call in medical records from the hospital and make a whole big story about it before they decide whether she needs chalitza or not. She was very upset. In the end, it got solved. One learned rabbi told her, or I should say told me to tell her after I brought the question to him, that most probably if she had had relations with her husband, we can go with the idea that maybe he had a little sperm and one of the children was actually his. And then he wouldn't need, she wouldn't need chalitza, yibum or chalitza. Third story. This takes place around 1960. There was a deaf woman who needed chalitza from her brother-in-law, who was also deaf. The husband that died was also deaf. So there are three deaf people here. We already mentioned that a deaf brother of the deceased cannot do chalitza. But a deaf man can do yibum. Guess what? Anyone can have sex. The only way out for this woman was to actually do ibum, that is to have sex with the brother-in-law and then to get divorced from him. This is horrific because not only was she an aguna to be freed only by having sex with this guy and then hoping he will give his, he will keep his promise to divorce her the next day, and hoping she won't get pregnant with him. What's the whole idea? The whole idea was for her to get pregnant. So everything is the opposite than what it should be. But also note that the brother of the deceased was ordered by the Bedin to have sex with her. How horrible is that? To get a court order to have sex with a sister-in-law after your brother died. This is sick. Can we believe that this is happening in the state and by the state of Israel today? I don't really have time to talk about solutions suggested throughout Jewish history and what I think should be done today. I will only say that the topic of Yibum and Chalitza has to be addressed properly. It has to be studied with an open eye and actions have to be taken in order to put aside this awful ruling that in the past was supposed to help the widow, but nowadays makes all parties suffer. I will leave it to Rachel to talk about how Center for Women's Justice can help you with this issue, but let's face it, we should be marrying in some way where all this doesn't even begin to happen. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you, Rivka, for spelling out the laws of Yibum and Chalitza for us. And it's so important to hear these stories and understand that this isn't just a theoretical legal exercise that you do in your head, but it's something that affects real people um, in sometimes devastating ways today. Um, ever since you told me that story, I've been thinking about it and it just, it's, I, I don't know how to even like comprehend that. It's not just that, especially the last story, you know, it's not just that she's, it's not just rape, it's the state forcing rape. As, as some of you may know in Israel, the Beit Din um, is controlled by the state. You can't go to a private rabbinic court. Um, if you want, you can only go through the state uh, mandated courts. And when they give you a judgment, that is a, a real court legal ruling that you have to follow or else be in contempt of the court. Like, I don't know how 
you deal with that. And someone hands you a judgment saying you are forced to have sex with this person. Um, anyway, so um, as we understand, you know, as we understand that the laws of Yibun Khalitsa, which at one point in time were a lifeline for widows who are living in a society where women could not inherit, women didn't own property, um, were generally extremely vulnerable if they didn't have a man to take over once their husband died. And we understand how now, thankfully, women's economic realities are different. And the very same mechanism that was once her salvation can harm her in really insidious ways, like we heard from Rivka. Uh, the good news, though, is that we can prevent this using tools that already exist within Jewish law. And in fact, we're going to talk about one right now. Um, so many of you may be familiar with the concept of a halakha prenup. By a show of hands, how many of you know what that is? Okay, a lot of people. Um, a halakha prenup is an agreement that a couple can sign before their wedding that sets up tools for civil and halakha recourse uh, intended to prevent a woman from becoming an aguna, meaning stuck in a marriage against her will. So there's a few different kinds of halakha prenups, actually. We're going to talk about CWJ's halakha prenup. Um, we'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, so CWJ's prenup includes a halakha bill that has a clause in it that specifically addresses chalitza. And it works by invoking the halakha mechanism known as tna'im bekirushin, which means conditions that uphold a marriage. So what does this mean? So the couple declares that the marriage is upheld as long as they fulfill certain conditions. And when those conditions are not fulfilled, it means the marriage was never valid to begin with and the couple was never actually married. So one of the conditions um, that in the prenup states that if the husband dies childless, and has a brother, and his wife is therefore obligated in chalitza. And three months have passed during which chalitza doesn't happen. And the couple agrees that their marriage was made conditional on the fact that they have surviving children. And because there are no children, the marriage conditions were never fulfilled and the marriage retroactively never happened. So that means that the woman does not need chalitza anymore and she's free to go. So this prenup clause isn't some newfangled invention, um, but it's actually rooted in halakhic literature and was used throughout history. Um, the Ramah, Rav Moshe Isler, um, notes uh, in his notes in the Shulchan Aruch, uh, talks about this very clause being used to prevent a widow from getting trapped by an ach mumar, meaning if her brother-in-law was no longer part of the Jewish community and could not perform the chalit ceremony. Uh, and this was in the 1500s. Uh, so this is not, this is really something that is quite old. Uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, another halachasist known as the Khatam Sofer uh, also used uh, a similar clause. And historically, Jewish communities have had all sorts of practices, um, like amending this clause into the ketubah itself, or even having prenups that the brother-in-law would sign during the wedding where he would agree mm -hmm. to perform chalitza if needed, or he would have to pay a fine. Um, the also thing to keep in mind is that in modern times, um, that until modern times, Divorce is a really a very rare thing because women didn't really have many ways to survive if they got divorced. And so get refusal was not actually a common concern um, historically. What people were more concerned about was chalitza and getting trapped that way. Remember, this was before modern medicine and when life expectancies were not so great. Uh, it was much more common for people to die young and childless than it is today, leaving young widows behind. And this is also before fertility treatments. So while today we think the chalitza is this very rare phenomenon, um, it was actually a lot more common historically than we think. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, adhering to the laws of chalitza is not just a religious choice in Israel. Uh, because there is no civil marriage and no civil divorce in Israel, only religious marriage and divorce, the state makes all Jews, regardless of their personal religious affiliation or lack thereof, follow these halachot. So CWJ believes that all Israelis should have the religious freedom to choose how and if to practice religion. And the state should really be in charge of the civil rather than the religious aspects of people's lives. So while we agitate for civil marriage and divorce in Israel, we also encourage all Jews in Israel who marry in halachic ceremony to sign the CWJ prenup that protects them from all kinds of marital captivity, whether if it's by get refusal, the kind that we're more familiar with, chalitza refusal, which we learned about today, or anything else. Um, this is more than a practical way for women to take their fate into their own hands. It's a shift in our mindset uh, that we as a community can see violations of our freedoms and empower ourselves to create justice that we need in its stead. Uh, so now we're going to turn the floor to all of you for some questions. Um, and Oh, okay, so I'll give you a couple of questions that, that we had. There's some great questions. So first, um, someone asked the question is whether any Jewish communities still practice Yibum? Uh, should I answer that? 
Yes, please. Okay, if I, if I don't, won't get muted. Um, no, I don't think there's anybody that practices Yibum. There were women that came to Israel from Yemen and the Sephardi communities who, who were, uh, you know, two women married to one because there was Yibum. I actually met a few months ago a girl who told me that her aunt was the, the, the only person or the first person in Israel to practice Yibum. And she was very excited and thought it was a wonderful thing that her aunt married whoever it was that uh, died with our children. I don't think anybody practices it today. But yes, Ravavati Yosef wanted to practice it. And when there was a case today, if you come to Israel and you say, but I'm in love with my brother-in-law, I do want to marry him. They won't allow you to marry. But Rabbi Vadi Yosef, who was the, the Sephardi chief rabbi a while back, he did allow people that were of Sephardi um, uh, um, edah uh, to marry, to do yibum. But there's, I don't think there's anybody else that would allow it today. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, another question that we had. Um, um, someone has asked, um, in modern times, what happens if both the woman and the brother-in-law test positive for Tay-Sex? Would, I guess the question is, would they still have to go through, like, would they, would that, would that mean that they're, they're exempt? They still have to, no, they're not exempt for anything. They still have to do Chalitza. They would still have to do Chalitza, yeah. And in fact, like I said, like I was mentioning, even if you're completely after menopause you still have to do in theory boom and then you have to do chalitza it doesn't matter how old you are it doesn't matter if you can't have children if he can't have children you still have to do chalitza um okay and we'll take another couple of questions that we had here um another halakha question rifka um, someone has asked, if a man has several brothers, how does it work? Does the widow have to get okay. Khalifa from every single one of them? Or no, 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 no. You who, has the... first, uh, who, has, who gets first dibs on the, uh, on, on, okay. the, uh, on the wife? You go to the oldest, and he is the one who is supposed to do it. If he doesn't want to do it, you go to the next one. If he doesn't want to do it, you go to that. You go down the line. And, and going to the next one, you mean that you have to do chalitza with each one? No, 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 or you, you don't do chalitza, wanna... you do, you ask them. You yeah. ask them, you go to the first one and ask him if he's willing to do chalitza. He may say, no, I'm married, I have children, I have grandchildren already, go to someone else. And then you go to the next one in line. And there's actually a story that I read and I, I wrote a midrash about it, where a woman uh, in Morocco goes uh, to, to do the yibum. They won't allow her to do chalitza, they want to do yibum. And she doesn't want to get married to the, to the first one. She says, I'll marry the, the younger one, but not the older one. And the rabbi, the Dayan says, why? What's the difference? And it's like, really? Oh, come on. No, what, there's no difference with who you have sex and who you're married to. And they basically say to her that, uh, and they, so they go to the older one and he wants to marry her. He wants to do Yibum because if he does Yibum, he'll get the inheritance. So he's looking at the money. And they say to her, and she says, no, I won't, I won't be with him. And she was married 50 years and had no children. So the rabbi said to her, well, if you don't do uh, yibum, you're not going to get anything. You get thrown out. You have no children. You'll get nothing. You won't get any inheritance. She says, okay, I won't get anything. And she, and she did that. And, she, and I, I wrote a, a midrash about her and made her a hero, a heroine of mine, who is stood up for the women of Israel who will not be, in a sense, raped or be given to someone that they don't want just because some crazy rule. I just this want to mention person. all of the you wrote yes, about a real it. person, yeah. yeah. Her it's name, was Jamila. Person was, Her name was Jamila. She lives in Morocco and she is my hero. She said no to oh, the rabbis. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I, these are modern stories. But so many of these are echoed in, you know, anybody who's learning track day even about right now will know how familiar these are. There's the whole question of who down the line in, in if you have a bunch of different brothers, who exactly, this is all where that comes from. And to see the same things that drive myself and many other people absolutely bonkers when we're learning even about as being the same now is, is almost the most 
shocking part of doing the learning. It's not only knowing the horrible stuff that is that is discussed in the track data in quite a lot of detail, but also the fact that it's happening now. So thank you for sharing those modern stories to show the 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 parallels through time and space that we have apparently come to here. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, so thanks, Miriam. Thanks, Rifka. Thanks, everyone for showing up here tonight. Um, really like, thanks Miriam, for your awesomeness. Um, that was a really great video. And the discussion that it um, that it uh, sparked was, was very important. Uh, thanks, Rifka, for your fascinating talk. And, and the stories and the things that you've experienced that have enriched uh, your perspective. And thanks, Michelle, for all the besides, beside the, the behind the scenes help. Um, and most of all, thanks to all of you for the important role you play by being here, by being the change that we need, uh, by taking what you heard today out of this event into other areas of your lives where you can have an impact. So talk about what you heard today at your Shabbos tables, with your communities, in your social circles. Uh, follow CWJ on social media, be part of our grassroots initiative for change, because this is a lot bigger, you know, than, than all of us. We can all sit here and listen to these stories and think like, wow, but the challenge is to take that and to do something with it. Um, so I just we're... want to say that I'm sorry if I insulted anyone and you're all, um, I'm calling anyone to talk to me about what I think about the rabbis who say these things and how I think we should change a lot of things. I, I, just wanna... I see all the discussion in the chat, but I haven't read all of it. But yeah, if, if anyone was upset by the way we worded things, we'd be happy to hear feedback. Um, and, you know, we apologize uh, for any harm that was caused by our language. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming to this event, watching the premiere of the videos. And I want to encourage anybody who can to donate whatever they feel comfortable in donating to the Center for Women's Justice, because I just think to myself how different things would have been for Naomi and Ruth had they just had a, 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 an advocate so, to support them going through what they went through. I mean, we are all just very incredibly lucky and blessed that organizations like this do exist now um, to try to fix things for women, for everybody, and make the world a vastly better place. So thank you so much. All right, thanks everyone. And we'll be following up and sending you links and things for those who registered. And uh, thanks so much everyone for being here and uh, good night or good morning, depending on where you are. Bye. <laughs>